What's going on? You're holding some papers. What's the big news in your world? Yeah, so the big news uh, in my world is they've discovered, they've seen, or they think they've seen gravitational wave background. So this is uh, a series of experiments, a bunch of experiments, but a bunch of different pulsar timing arrays think they've seen a background of gravitational waves. And this, this will be the first time people have seen anything like this. This was in July, and it's really taken the, taken the field by storm since then. It all happened on one day. All of the different pulsar timing array experiments put out papers which just arrived in our inbox that morning and they all had essentially the same picture which was that they'd all seen this background of gravitational waves which is something people had theorized about existing for a long time but suddenly was seen. How can they make this claim? Oh great, yeah. So they have the most ingenious uh, observation uh, that we live on Earth and surrounding us we have our galaxy. In our galaxies we have these uh, pulsars several pulsars. These pulsars are very fast rotating neutron stars. And they have this beam of light, like a lighthouse, and once in a while the light crosses our path. And amongst these pulsars, there are some pulsars which are actually millisecond. So that means in a second they rotate thousand times. And there are huge objects in the sky as a quite fast rotation. That's crazy fast, isn't it? Super crazy fast, okay. <laughs> and then they are very, very stable clocks. They are almost, in fact, until a decade ago, uh, pulsars, were, these millisecond pulsars, were the best clock that we ever had. Okay, so they are great timekeepers. And then imagine a gravitational wave passing through them. And a gravitational wave is actually a stretch and compression of space. And it's a special kind of stretch and compression, which is different from a sound wave, which is also a stretch and compression of space. It's just that in sound wave, compresses and stretches a medium, like, let's say air, water. Gravitational wave can stretch and compress the fabric of space-time. Okay, the second thing, second difference is that it's a, what we call a quadrupolar compression, which means uh, that uh, if a gravitational wave is passing like that, then it will compress the space in one direction, then it will stretch simultaneously in the orthogonal, perpendicular direction. Now, if we are on Earth and we have a bunch of uh, pulsars around them, we know their timing pretty well, their great clocks. As the gravitational wave passes through them, Let's say the gravitational wave stretches in that direction. So a couple of pulsars which are like this, they get stretched like that. And the other two pulsars which are like th on the other side, perpendicular to them, they get compressed towards Earth. So you would see that this lighthouse signal, which is quite a good clock, it comes to you from these two directions quicker than expected. And the other two directions slower than expected. And that's the telltale signature of gravitational waves. So they have observed these pulsars for about 15 years and they have seen a yearly variation in this kind of systematic pattern. So we've seen gravitational waves before, but the ones we've seen by LIGO and Virgo are a few kilometers long in terms of their wavelength. And this one is light years long, so it's a completely different game. What could have produced them? So definitely not the same things as LIGO and Virgo. They're colliding black holes, aren't they? Exactly. Right. These colliding black holes, they're a few kilometers wide themselves and maybe a few kilometers apart, or tens of kilometers. So there's no way they can make a wave on light year scales. There's a bunch of different possibilities, and one possibility is just a massive, massive black hole, a supermassive black hole, which itself is, let's say, a billion times bigger than the previous black holes we've seen. And so pairs of those colliding could potentially cause this signal. But there's a bunch of other predictions as well which could cause this signal. So the waves that we've seen are a background. It's not like we've seen them coming from a particular direction. Um, they, they look more like the waves on the sea, not like a tidal wave, but like in general, there's waves. People have thought that it might be a bit like the cosmic microwave background, where we have light coming from, from all directions, from the, from the early Big Bang. And this would be like a similar thing, but in gravitational waves. So we have a gravitational wave background. It's kind of like the, the waves of the sea stretching and squeezing space time. Quarks in the early universe at very, very high temperatures uh, in, in the very early universe, just after the hot Big Bang, are expected to be um, free and kind of move around freely, happily. But then as the universe cooled, at some point those quarks got trapped together into hadrons, into protons and into neutrons. And that happened at kind of a moment uh, in time when the universe was about 10 to the 12 Celsius or Kelvin or whatever. Uh, obviously roughly the same at that point. If this happened in a kind of dramatic way, if, if all the hadrons when they were first produced uh, happened in what's called a first order phase transition, then, then that could have produced gravitational waves or would have produced gravitational waves and those could 
uh, be the ones we're seeing today. Um, so, so that's another possibility. Another leading candidate to explain the signal. Uh, the signal is a bit too steeper than what black hole models expect. So we want some kind of signal which goes steep and high in amplitude. They can also cause by large quantum fluctuations in the early universe. So we see all these galaxies today in the universe and we are very sure that all these galaxies are formed by tiny quantum fluctuations in the early universe which was created by inflation. Once in a while, inflation can create large quantum fluctuations, especially large quantum fluctuations of small wavelength. And when these fluctuations uh, in the later universe, they start to push around the plasma a lot. Once in a while, the plasma can collapse to form primordial black holes. And the overall effect would be of this compressed plasma in the early universe. And any kind of compressed plasma is a great source for gravitational waves. So you would also see gravitational waves because of compression of plasma. And these are what we call scalar induced gravitational waves. Gravitational waves induced by scalar density fluctuations or sound waves. They're probably one of the best candidates that fit the data. So they're the best fitting model so far. And this is a topic that I work on. So I'm also super interested and excited about it. Is every theorist though looking at this data and thinking, oh, this fits my idea and everyone's trying to shape it to fit their idea? <laughs> Would have been nice, but in this paper, uh, in the paper where they announced that uh, what kind of new physics can fit this model, they do a comparison between different theories and they say which theory fits better and which doesn't. And there are some theories which fit better than other theories which don't fit that good. So there is actually a hierarchy of comparison between different uh, theories. And uh, what we have seen is cosmic superstrings and these uh, scalar induced gravitational waves, they fit the best. Definitely better than supermassive black holes, at least 50 times better. So there is a factor they compute says the probability of explaining the data better than purely supermassive black holes. And for these models, some of them are 50, 60 factors higher. So quite well explaining. So the pictures show the signal. This picture, for example, shows the signal in green and the prediction from supermassive black holes in blue. And you can see they don't quite agree, but they're not that far apart either. This plot at the beginning is partly what motivates other new physics explanations like this quark hadron transition. You can see this, this blue area has quite large error bars and really we need to understand supermassive black holes better if we want to, to know if they can explain the signal. If these waves are passing through everywhere all the time and they're powerful enough to affect pulsars, why aren't they affecting you and me? Why don't we feel it? Why don't we get ripped apart by it? Like it seems like these are... Oh uh, well, they're powerful but gravity is a weak force. So I'm being held as, a, as one body through electromagnetic force, like my muscle, etc. That's much, much stronger than gravity. So if a gravitational wave passes through me, I will get distorted, just like the pulsars, uh, but I won't feel it because it's negligible compared to my overall size. However, if you look at Earth and pulsar, they're not held by electromagnetic force. They're, held, they're just floating around in space freely. So a little bit of change in their distance due to gravitational waves can be caught by a delay in a signal arrival time. So that's how you can use big scale, galactic scale experiments to catch them. I know you're a theorist. This is a result of some experimental work as well, clearly. Yeah. Is this like a triumph for the experimentalists or is this like a great moment for the theorists? H who's lording it over who at the moment? Um, yeah, good one. I guess this is a triumph of the experimentalists and the theorists are just hoping that the experimentalists can do, a, yeah, uh, I mean, as we get to the 16 and the 20 year data set, hopefully we'll have a bit more data on like the spectral shape of this or the type of waves, the amplitude of these waves and so on. And then we'll be able to tell which theory is best. Uh, but for now, um, it's difficult to tell. Like the theorists have lots of predictions and the experimentalists are leading the way. What's the next step in this area of research? Is it going to come from theorists? Do you need more experiments? What are we all waiting for now? What's the next hurdle? Yes, from both sides. First of all, we have this observational tool. They have this amazing set of 68 millisecond pulsars. So they can test the timing even better and better over the time. As theorists of early universe, uh, we want to figure out all the different processes which can give rise to a gravitational wave signal which matches with what we have seen. And uh, there are several possible scenarios uh, which would uh, emit gravitational waves in the early universe when the universe was younger than one second old, much younger than one second old. So it's a really early universe. In fact, all of those topics are pursued here. Uh, 
and, and some of us work actively on this topic. So we want to figure out what the signal is expected from a theory so that we can test directly. I'm interested in the early universe, I'm interested in particle physics, I want to know what the universe is made of at the smallest scales, like what are quarks made of anything, like these kind of questions. And with the Large Hadron Collider, you can only collide stuff so hard and eventually you run out of being able to turn the energy up. And if we want to find out more about particle physics, we're going to have to look now to the early universe, to cosmology. And with light, we're stuck at the cosmic microwave background because before that time, at higher energies in the cosmic microwave background, the universe was opaque, so light couldn't pass through it. But with gravitational waves, gravitational waves pass freely through even the densest things. They pass through neutron stars, for example. So we have like a direct signal from way higher energy things going on and possibly direct signals that can tell us about what the universe is made of at the smallest scales. These, what, 60-odd pulsars being used as an instrument like this, is, well, it's pretty clever, isn't it? Like, yeah, incredibly clever. I think it was Stephen Detweiler that came up with this, like, absolutely amazing idea, so inspired. I don't know, I guess it's the first time we've had a bit of experimental kit that's so much bigger than the Earth. Do check out the links on screen and in the video description for more on the topics we've covered today. Gravitational waves, Large Hadron Collider, all that good stuff. And if you think you'd like to study or work in the School of Physics at the University of Nottingham, well, there's a link in the video description about that as well. They start going so rapidly around one another, they begin to approach the speed of light, in fact something like 60% of the speed of light. 